Yes, I think the recording has started. I see it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, and thanks to Nick as well, uh, and everybody that's both in person and attending virtually. Um, I'm so excited to see uh, you know meetups and other things uh, getting together again in person. Um, I think building that community is really important. Um, I also am really excited to not um, spread the novel coronavirus uh, everywhere. And so as I am recovering, it's great that we have this option of um, setting up a virtual meeting um, so that we can still, you know, learn and get a community um, even when, you know, things go sideways as they sometimes often do. I made it almost three years. I was so excited. Um, and then I got, then I got slimed last week. Um, as Nick said, uh, my name is Matt Steele. Um, I'm one of the organizers for the Java user group. Um, and I've also helped with uh, Nebraska JS periodically. Um, so one one question that I think that I got to see earlier is who here, just a raise of hands, is here for uh, <coughs> excuse me, is here for Nebraska JS? Yeah. Very cool. <clears throat> and uh, who here is for Ojug? That's awesome. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. So, you know, this is a <clears throat> this is a joint meetup, and um, <clears throat> a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of JavaScript specific. But I think this is a really great time for folks to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, you know, learn a little bit from each uh, uh, different folks in the different communities. Because <clears throat> really, we're not that much different in terms of the things that are important to us, um, the things that we struggle with, um, and the, you know, the tools and the lessons that we're learning. And I, I think the, the best way to kind of see that is just in, in meme culture. So one thing that I noticed uh, when I started to <clears throat> look at uh, look at what what is it that JavaScript and Java programmers <clears throat> find important, and you know the, the memes are the the truest way to the heart of a of a community I think, and you know it, I see a lot of frustration um, around <clears throat> uh, build tools, so whether it is extremely long build times or um, having to wait, uh, you know, a really long time for your uh, dependencies to download. Having an extremely convoluted build chain um, in tools that you don't really understand, um, you know, becomes a, an issue. And then sometimes it's just the exact same meme you know, whether you're waiting for a Maven install or an NPM install to finish, you know, the, the memes, they just write themselves. So what I wanted to talk to you today is um, some of the frustrations that I've seen around um, JavaScript builds tools in particular. My hope is that we can see a lot of the similarities on the Java side as well. And that no matter which community you're coming from, that you can take away um, some lessons and some, you know, evaluations about what is important in terms of a developer experience and how can you work on making that better um, for yourself. <laughs> so I wanted to talk through um, this particular meme, you know, uh, that that right now um, on the Java side we end up having, like, we're basically forced to use Maven um, or a build tool in general. Um, you know, it's a compiled language. And as such, you have to, at the very least, have Java C in place before you can, uh, before you can reasonably, like, take the Java source files and get them ready. But there's obviously a ton of other addi additional stuff. And I have seen hundreds of lines thousands of lines, just unrecognizable, you know, uh, Lovecraftian style uh, build configurations um, over the years. And, you know, every time that I open up one of those up, I feel just a little bit bummed. Um, and then I dive in and realize this is what we're, this is what we're all, you know, uh, paid to work on. But that's on the Java side. 
you know, one of the questions uh, that I kind of think through is, we don't, from a, but, you know, JavaScript doesn't have those same sorts of um, limitations. It's a dynamic language. It runs um, using an interpreter. So why do we have massive build tool chains and other, uh, you know, other uh, complexities that we've added in? Does anyone have an, you know any thoughts on why you would run a build script uh, before you uh, before you deployed out your JavaScript? Tree shaking. Tree shaking. Great. Yep, that's a that's a great one. Bundling. Bundling. Yep, absolutely. To compile the TypeScript you're actually writing. Oh, compiling the TypeScript. Now we're we're getting a bit into the future, but I, I like the way you're thinking. So I think you're right. Um, or yeah, was there another one? Splitting like a progressive web app. Yeah, splitting. So the the phrase that I've heard for that is code splitting, uh, which is where you kind of uh, uh, separate out your project into um, only loading the files that are needed on particular UIs. So these are more advanced <clears throat> types of optimizations, and a lot of them fall into some of these categories. So, like I said, you know, making sure that the code that you're authoring um, might look a little bit different from what you're deploying out into production, and that's reasonable, right? There might be optimizations that a compiler can make. Um, it may, uh, you know, it may make sense to author your code in multiple files, but then um, bring it all into a single file or you know, more optimized versions whenever you're deploying it out um, so that you reduce the number of HTTP downloads. Um, one of the big ones that historically has been a reason why you would add a bundler is this particular function. Um, so the require function is not built into browsers. Um, it's, it's something that was introduced by the common JS specification and made you know, especially popular in the Node.js world. Um, you know, if you think about uh, if you've written any server side JavaScript, you've probably seen things like require FS. Um, that module specification was never introduced into browsers, but there was a ton of useful stuff that was published into the server side uh, JavaScript package repository called NPM over the years. And so, in order for us as browser developers to take advantage of a lot of those features, um, we had to find a way to convert those require uh, methods into something that a browser could understand. So historically, this has been through a number of different tools, um, one of which is Webpack that I want to talk through a little bit. Um, how many, uh, just from a show of hands, how many folks are familiar with Webpack, have heard of the technology maybe? Okay, uh, so it looks like a, a fair number of folks. Now, how many of you have uh, have used Webpack either by like configuring it yourself or using a tool that maybe has Webpack built into it? Okay, looks like a lot of the same, a lot of the same sorts of folks. Um, so it's a really so Webpack as a tool, um, it's built into a whole lot of different functionality. Um, you know, the uh, for example, the Create React app um, tool uses a Webpack under the hood. Uh, the Angular CLI uses that as well, um, you know, and it's it is extremely robust and modular. Um, it can take you know any number of source files um, with their dependencies, run it through Webpack, and then produce a set of static assets that can then be loaded by a browser. Here's another way to look at that view. Um, you may start with a uh, you know an entry point, it might be your index.js file or your main. .js file, and then you have a number of different um, routes with modules. Each of these may have their own sets of dependencies. And ultimately, what you end up producing is a bundle file. Um, and this bundle uh, is something that can then be loaded by a browser. Um, there may be some additional fanciness that happens here. Um, there may be you know, code splitting and some of those other types of optimizations. But all of this ha work has to be completed because you know this entry file may be TypeScript. Um, it may have common JS required uh, uh, functions. Um, you know, a, a lot of this stuff can't be loaded by default by a browser, or at least historically, that's been the case. 
So um, I want to think through a couple of limitations that historically that we've had as a UI uh, community that may not be true anymore. So first of all, what if we didn't rely on using non-standard module specifications that were built for server-side JavaScript, but um, <clears throat> you know, but aren't uh, available in browsers? You know, ever since um, 2015, uh, there's been a new spec or there's been a specification for loading up uh, modules uh, natively inside browsers. You know, can we use that? Um, what if we didn't uh, have to bundle all of our application code, all of our libraries in development? Uh, you know, what if what if that, those production sort of optimizations were things that you just did during production and wasn't something that you know prevented you from uh, starting up a development server? And then you know it's it's the year of our you know it's the it's the year of our Lord 2023. Um, what if we started to build for modern browsers and the ones that our users are actually using instead of the legacy um, that we've had to deal with historically? You know, it was a beautiful day back in 2021. I believe it was July 9th um, that Microsoft officially stopped supporting Internet Explorer. Um, and, you know, what a glorious day that was. Uh, but that also means that we have the chance to reevaluate a lot of the tools that we were using that were originally built for a different era of web development. So that's what I want to talk through today is the uh, a new build uh, library called Vite that takes some of these assumptions and tries to run with them as far as they will go. So as Nick uh, mentioned, uh, Vite uh, rhymes with neat uh, or feet or you know uh, or whatever you would like. Uh, it is a French word uh, that uh, stands for or that it is quick. Um, their official pronunciation is that it rhymes with sweet. Um, and it was created by Evan Yu. Um, now Evan Yu is one of the original uh, developers of the Vue programming language or the Vue framework. Um, has anybody uh, either heard of or used Vue in the past? Cool. Yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of hands. That's awesome. Um, it's a very popular uh, framework. Um, I've I've had a whole lot of fun uh, building out with it as well. Um, but the neat thing about Vite is that it's not just for Vue applications. Um, as they were designing out and developing the Vite uh, uh, tool, they tried to make it um, semi opinionated. So no matter what uh, framework you use on a day-to-day -day basis, there's likely an option for you to build out um, using this tool chain. You know, they wanted to make sure that it worked for Svelte. They wanted to make sure that it worked for Preact, um, React, um, as well as Vue. And if you just want to make a vanilla HTML or a vanilla TypeScript uh, project, then you don't have to use any framework at all if you don't want. So they're really positioning Vue as a as a low-ish level tool that isn't tied into one particular framework, but instead works with a lot. It also has a really great community that's built around it. So if you want to build on top of Vite, um, or if there's a, uh, a, a framework that isn't officially supported, there may be something that's been built out by the community. Um, I've seen unofficial um, repositories to integrate Vite into uh, static site generators like Eleven D. Um, to build into other frameworks like Angular, um, you know, and and it continues to grow over time. It's been built to be modular enough that if the official uh, library isn't supporting it, that might be okay. And then this one is just for Nick, um, but it has TypeScript uh, functionality built in and uh, presumed by not by default, right? You can turn TypeScript off, but you don't have to do anything special to get TypeScript working. Um, and you know, as a as a so I know that uh, I'm not seeing Nick celebrating or like gesticulating wildly. All right, now here we're talking. Um, but you know, as as someone that that has started to gravitate towards statically, um, you know, static languages and ones that have static typing, um, I really like that as well. You know, seeing tools that just understand that there's a lot of benefits from having strong typing and not relying on, uh, you know, dynamic typing uh, to you know the. It's nice that that's built in and that you don't have to do additional work to get that to function. In fact, I think the experience of working with TypeScript in a Vite environment is substantially better than some of the other um, tools that, uh, that we've got to use. 
And that's through the use of some kind of modern functionality that we'll talk through in a bit. So the cool thing about Vite, um, like I mentioned, is that it's open source. So you have the you have the ability to um, you know not only see the official uh, code, and it has a robust um, you know community uh, process to govern and manage it, but it also has a lot of you know broad functional support um, across the the rest of the community, and that's where there's a lot of um, you know there's a nice awesome Vite repository that we'll show here in a bit. Um, but the 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 nice thing is again is that it's not uh, it's not something that's being built just uh, in a corner and then released. It really has a, a nice community built around it, and I really like seeing that for you know, tools that I'll be uh, that I'll be building on top of um, you know my applications. So let's talk through some of the features that Beat has. Um, you know, the first one and one that they're really trying to optimize is to make sure that, you know, your application, um, when you start up a development server, so if you want to work on code, you shouldn't have to wait um, unnecessarily for builds to go through. And there's a number of tricks that uh, Beat uses in order to make this incredibly fast. Um, but the first is that it uses at its core um, this, this tag, so script type equals module. Um, so with this, uh, so uh, this is something that's built into modern browsers. Um, every browser that's currently supported um, from Google, Microsoft, Apple, Firefox, um, the Brave browser, um, all support modules and have, and have supported for several years. But the nice functionality of this is that if you're writing your code um, to uh, use native ECMAScript uh, imports and exports, then you can load those directly. So what that means is that um, we almost invert the chart that we had looked at earlier. So when your server is ready, the first time that a request is made, um, then Vite will uh, will dynamically or just basically allow for those requests to be passed through from the entry point. And then whatever files that you need to load um, will just be loaded. There's no bundling that's happening during development. And that means that an entire category of just time that you end up having to um, wait around goes away. Um, you also have the ability to, so uh, so that's one kind of optimization. The second optimization that happens, uh, or that V takes advantage of, is it separates out your source code from the dependencies that your project has. So if you think about your source code, that's the stuff that's going into your source um, you know, uh, directory. And then all of your dependencies are the things that are showing up in your node modules. Well, your node modules generally, like you're not, unless, you're, uh, unless you have um, uh, a glutton for punishment, um, you're not going to be going into the node modules folders and making changes to those files. I would never recommend doing that. But that also means that um, you should have the ability to uh, bundle each of the dependencies a single time during development and then cache that off. Um, and then so that if, you know, the first time that you load in, say, Angular um, in your project, that you can, you only have to load, you only have to bundle that a single time. And then you can just re-serve that same file over and over and over again. You know, there's no reason that you should have to rebuild the entire dependency tree um, just because that it, uh, you know, because you changed all your source files. Um, and it uses a kind of best of breed tools for this. And in particular, uh, we'll talk about ES build here in a little bit, but this is a, a relatively new uh, tool that tries to build on top of some of the existing tools that have uh, historically been used to make your project run, you know, uh, compile down um, your TypeScript uh, and others. Um, but uh, it's been built with a couple of optimizations in mind um, to really run fast and to bake in some of the best practices um, that we've learned with over time. So the real theme about the way that Vite uh, treats its development server is that in order to go faster and to get your code back up and running, you just do less work. You know, the less um, rework that has to be done, the more that you can take advantage of native browser functionality to improve performance, uh, the better off you'll be. Um, that both simplifies the tool chain and it also means that it runs faster. 
Um, so we've already talked about some of the pre-bundling of the dependencies that Beat does by default, so that it's not rebuilding the view framework. Um, you know, it, it's inside your no node modules over and over again. It just does it once, and then it's there forever. But it also takes advantage of um, some of the default browser caching functionality. So if uh, your files are not changed, then Vite won't transfer them over. They'll just send a 304 not modified header. Um, and it also does long lasting caching. You know, this means that whenever you're doing your development, you don't have to wait for files to be transferred, in, which you know, usually is pretty fast when you're running on localhost, but every little bit matters. Um, one thing that Vite also doesn't do is it doesn't try to um, transpile your code down to work with older uh, browsers. Um, traditionally, we've used tools like Babel to do this. Um, but uh, uh, depending on the particular um, uh, environment that you want to build for, you know, most evergreen browsers are pretty good now. And so long as you're not trying to use um, a language feature that is extremely cutting edge, um, you're probably good um, developing in the same code that you're authoring with. Um, with the with the exception of a few transformations which would need to get get done but you know you know because that you no longer have to build for internet explorer um or other just really old uh really unsupported browsers a bare set of transforms um can be done uh to your code which really speeds up your development as well and then es build also has a couple of features that um uh, that you get just by default. So if you're writing React code, um, you may have to transform your um, your markup. So the components that have the angle braces, um, that JSX functionality um, is built into ES build. And then if you want to convert from TypeScript and remove the type annotations, um, then ES build will do that for you as well. So a lot of these kind of uh, standard uh, types of operations um, have been uh, uh, have been kind of baked in and are really optimized um, so that you know the the tool is doing the minimal amount of work in order to render code on your you know on your app. So that's all on the development side. But uh, when you're building for production, you don't want you know your development experience necessarily to be the same thing that your users are getting when you deploy out your code. Um, and you know, and, and that's for various reasons. But you know, a lot of these optimization optimizations still make sense to do in a you know in a production world. So Veet wants to make sure that whenever you are ready to go to prod, um, that your code is optimizable. Um, you know, using the best of breed tools. So what that means is that um, you know you still once you're ready to actually perform a production build, then a different set of tools, which take a little bit longer to run. Um, but are more optimized for some of those production features um, you end up getting out of the box. So um, under the hood, uh, Beat is using Rollup went to uh, to bundle your assets, uh, perform minimization, that tree shaking um, functionality to remove unused code, um, and a number of other optimizations um, that are all just baked in. Um, and because that it is Rollup, if you want to uh, extend that with additional plugins and other functionality, um, all of that is available from the community. You don't have to wait for Vite to build those things out for yourself. And a lot of these optimizations, you know, are really worth. Um, you know, there's just a ton of functionality that if you go through the documentation that Vite has, um, you know, you can see that it, it does code splitting for CSS, um, async chunk loading optimization. Um, a lot of these, I'm you know, I'm honestly uh, not familiar with myself. Um, but it's, it's nice to know that you know you don't have to be an expert in production optimization um, and take those matters into your own hands just because uh, you wanted to have a fast development server. Um, like I mentioned, there's a number of different starter templates. So <clears throat> depending on the kind of framework or language, or sorry, the framework or kind of tool chain that you like to use, um, there's a number of uh, tools that are available just outside of the box. So, uh, you know, and you can see a number of these on the awesome Vite uh, repository. Um, but you can see that, you know, if you want to do stuff with uh, vanilla JS, then there's a number of different templates that are available. If you want to do stuff using Vue, if you want to, oh man, there's a lot of Vue ones. Um, 
if you want to build with React, um, Spelt, Electron, Solid, um, all of these are templates that the community has built out to support the functionality that you want to get. But if all that you want to do is, you know, just take a really basic starter, then the v, uh, uh, the core team um, supports a handful of uh, libraries, and those starters are bare bones, but they're just enough for you to get started. So if you like uh, building out your code using vanilla JavaScript without a framework, then you can either write it in JavaScript or in TypeScript. And then the same is true for um, a number of different uh, frameworks. So uh, you don't have to, you know, and, and um, one thing that I found, uh, and I'll talk about this in the project that I worked through, is um, if you if you want to change frameworks, um, you know, you can regenerate your project, and then uh, a lot of your Vite configuration will be the same, with the extension of just removing one or two lines. So it almost may, you know, it, uh, there's there's some nice benefits to using the same tool, even if you want to choose a different framework um, later. Okay, so uh, so that's been that's been a lot of talk. Um, let's actually see what V looks like whenever you are uh, building out a project. Okay, so going to start up. Um, I just want to show kind of the functionality of two projects. Um, one that was built using um, the kind of a Webpack based chain. Um, and in this case, it's a, a Create React app um, application um, that I just generated as a starting point. So there's not a whole lot of functionality um, that into this. But I'm going to uh, just NPM start it, make this a little bit bigger. So you can see that it's, it's starting its thing. Okay, okay, starting the development server. And there we go. So, you know, that, that was okay. Um, that wasn't the slowest thing in the world, but it certainly wasn't the fastest. Um, and one of the problems that you end up seeing is that um, uh, the amount of time that it takes for a project to build um, using Webpack is fairly linear. Um, just that the the bigger that your code base, is, um, that your the amount of time that it takes for the project to be ready to run, um, takes about you know uh, if you double the code size, then it takes about double the amount of time. You know, um, we uh, unfortunately I, I'm guessing that it's pretty common for you to see. Um, the you know just a, a really long build time you know you just if you open up a project and you're like oh my god i know that this is going to take me 10 minutes for it to to finish you know compiling down like that's a terrible feeling um but uh you know unfortunately that's that's the type of sort of thing that happens here so uh by comparison let's go to Uh, beat project. So this uh, this project is all uh, set up to run um, a React application. Um, I'm actually kind of uh, stacking the deck against because that um, the Create React app uh, project was built using just JavaScript, whereas the Vite project um, is built using TypeScript. So um, you know it has to do kind of an additional step of converting from your TypeScript code into JavaScript, but you know, I think it's going to be okay. So uh, now, do an npm run dev. And so now it's ready in 2745. If we open this up. Oh, did that not load? Oh, Windows. 
Here we go. Okay. So, you know, and as I make changes to this, um, so if I'm going to say, you know, Mojo, let's, let's go to yes. As I'm making these changes, the hot module reloading and other pieces, you know, basically allow for these changes to be done instantly. Um, and the neat thing about this is that because that we're just, uh, you know, basically serving these uh, these files directly, that if we make a change to a single file, um, that Vite only has to invalidate that one file. It doesn't have to rebuild an entire source tree because that it knows that none of those other files have changed. So that's, that's um, you know, it's one optimization, but it's just by using the platform, um, it ends up getting a lot of those same um, just functionality that you would get from, you know, the traditional way of development, um, you know, where if you just make a single change to a single file, you don't have to reload every file that is in that directory. And V doesn't assume that either. So, you know, that's, that's another thing that's just, it's kind of neat. Okay. So uh, those are those are just some of the you know the, the starter projects um, for uh, you know the, and and you can already see that there's some benefit from using um, tools that are built around ES modules and don't have some of the kind of legacy build tools um, built around them. But I want to talk through you know my first introduction to Vite, um, one of the projects that I worked on um, over the summer, uh, and just show what I learned uh, from it and demo it a little bit. <clears throat> So uh, what I built was a tool um, that helped me track um, uh, my bike rides um, on an event called Gravel Worlds. So uh, I'm curious, have uh, who here uh, is a is a cyclist or knows a bike rider? Um, you know, has has some bikes in in your life. Cool. So I'm uh, I want to be friends with all of you. Um, and uh, and those of you that aren't, I'm going to talk your ear off about it. Um, and so just bear with me. Um, but I really like um, riding bikes. Um, I like riding them outside. I like riding them inside. Um, and I like building projects that help, um, you know, that, that intersect with technology. One of the, one of the really big uh, events that happens here in Nebraska is an event called Gravel World. And this is an event that's held in Lincoln every year. Um, and it is an, uh, it's an event that's held in the summer. Um, and it is uh, what's called an endurance gravel race. Now, what this means is that all the uh, all the racers um, are on public roads, um, but they are uh, unpaved uh, and then dirt or gravel. You know, if you think about it, once you get outside of the city, you have hundreds and hundreds of miles of pristine uh, roads that are perfect for riding on. And here's the coolest part: there's no cars anywhere. Um, you know, you basically have the entire road to yourself. And so, Gravel Worlds is a celebration of that. Um, so uh, every year, uh, thousands of uh, riders from all around the world um, end up uh, coming to Lincoln uh, in August to participate in these endurance events. There's different distances uh, that you can do, everywhere from a 50 kilometer race all the way up to a 300 mile, uh, 30 hour endurance event. Uh, and I've tried several of these different uh, distances. Um, this is me uh, starting off at the start of this uh, this year's Gravel Worlds. Um, I I feel like I was probably in pretty good spirits uh, at this time. Um, however, uh, this year I had signed up for that 300 mile distance. And I've never done anything even close to that in the past. So um, you know, 30 hours later, um, I uh, I definitely had less of a smile on my face, um, but it was nice to be accomplished. You know, and and I did finish it, so I was really excited about that. One of the cool things about Gravel Worlds is that every year, the course is just a little bit different. Um, so the, they usually start and finish in the same location um, in the Fallbrook meta, our neighborhood um, just north of Lincoln. Um, but the course uh, is going to be unique um, and it's gonna have different challenges along the way. You know, going north um, out of Lincoln um, by some of the, uh, like the branched oak um, uh, area is incredibly hilly. You know, they call that the, Bo the Bohemian Alps um, of Nebraska. Um, going down further south, um, you know, it's a little bit flatter, um, but sometimes you're just so far away from uh, aid stations um, or, you know, in, in what really it is, is like Casey's gas stations to pick up a slice of pizza that you end up having to carry all uh, with you. 
But because that it's a different course each year, it also means that it's hard for folks to uh, watch and you know and uh, and, uh, and see where you're at um, and how you're and how you're progressing. Um, so I wanted to help out with that. Uh, Jason, I see you have a uh, uh, question. Up, if you're trying to talk, you might be muted. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep up. Oh, okay, you don't, awesome. Uh, so yeah, like I mentioned, um, the course uh, this year uh, for the, for what they called the long voyage, um, you know, kind of snaked down, went south, um, went actually into Kansas, um, and then kind of snaked back up into uh, Nebraska. Um, and it was, you know, an event that started at 6 p.m. one day, you ended up riding overnight, um, and then into the next day, um, and you got to see all the beautiful scenery that, uh, you know, that central um, uh, rural Nebraska has to offer. So one of the ways that um, they try to make this interesting for or for um, you know people that aren't participating is through uh, what's called dot watching. <clears throat> so uh, there's a website um, that uh, as you are uh, as you are working or sorry as you're writing you have a GPS tracker that you're carrying with you, uh, and then that can feed into uh, you know a, a commercial system uh, called Track Leaders, and as uh, you are riding around then there is a kind of a race calendar. Um, so you can see all the different racers and um, just every five minutes or so, um, this data will ping. Um, and so you can see, you know, this uh, this particular racer is just blasting through uh, this course. I'm somewhere further like back here, you know, in the back two thirds, but that's okay. I'm having a good time with it. Um, so so this uh, uh, application is one that's been, you know, it's, it's used um, relatively um, uh, common in these types of endurance events. Um, but, you know, it's not a whole, there's not a whole lot of customizations that you can do. You know, if I wanted to um, keep track of how long I stay up at aid stations, um, then there's no real good way to uh, get visibility into that. If I wanted to share a single link for like how for my friends and family to see, you know, to let them know how I'm doing, there's not a great way to see that either. So, you know, this is a nice starting point, but, you know, like most things, um, or like a lot of things uh, technology-based, um, you know, once you have the ability to, uh, to build your own tools, that becomes both a superpower and a curse. Um, so what I ended up doing uh, was uh, working on a site that uh, gives similar sort of functionality, but um, you know, really kind of optimized for for my use case. And so that's what I built. So this uh, app will load up, and you can see that uh, this is just one big map. If you zoom out far enough, then you can see the similar sort of course starts here in Lincoln. Um, kind of goes clockwise and drops you down into Marysville, Kansas, and the like. So as um, you know, as the app is loading, here I'll reload this again. So uh, there's a pop-up that you can see where it shows, you know, based on where I'm at, I'm um, kind of how many miles into the progression of the of the race I am. Um, because that I start started and stopped at the same location that thinks that I'm at zero miles, but trust me, it was 301, and that one extra mile, oh man, that was that was something. Um, but uh, but you can see there there are small dots um, along the along this entire course, and that's one of those GPS pings. So every time that my tracker would emit out where I was, I would be capturing that and then storing that on this event. And then I also use some uh, geofencing tools uh, built into some uh, uh, built into some cloud functionality, so that I could show you know at this particular aid station, and by aid station again, this is just a gas store or you know a gas station, a convenience mart. Um, but what time did I arrive there? So at mile 51 um, shows that I got there at about you know uh, what is that 8:41, and then I left at 9:01. Uh, it's actually longer than I probably would have wanted to stay there, but you know, the, but uh, but these are the types of things that you can build out, um, you know, once you once you have um, that tickle to build out your own your own sort of app.
Um, <clears throat> so the the entire tool of it, um, the Veet app, uh, is only one small portion. Um, I, I I built the entire thing um, as a kind of a serverless uh, proof of concept. Um, I'm happy to talk your ear off about all of this, but all the ser the serverless stuff was built in Go. Um, and while we have OJUG and Nebraska JS here, we don't have a Go meetup, so I'm going to avoid most of this functionality and really talk about the Veet app um, because you know I, I feel like we there, there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening there. Um, as an example of what uh, folks, if they were pulling this up on their app, would see. Uh, during the day, um, you can just see my dot kind of moving around. Um, and then as I am kind of making my way through the event, um, I'm pass passing through those green geofences. Um, and, uh, you know, and you can see like when my last update uh, ended up occurring. So overall, um, you know, I got a lot of feedback that for folks that were trying, just were interested in kind of how the event was going, uh, where I was in the race, um, and how long I was stopping, you know, that I hadn't just, you know, passed out on the side of a, of a gravel road somewhere. And like this was, this is a cool way of sharing my experience with others. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that uh, that I was able to do uh, using this tool. And so let's uh, actually just switch over to the code and some of that functionality. So this is the code base for the UI. Um, you can see that there is a beat.config.js file at the root of it. Um, and that's, you know, that's the, that's the uh, configuration that is used for beat to do its work. Um, from a package perspective, um, the only thing that you end up adding into your project is just beat. Um, there's, you know, there's not uh, 20 different dependencies. Uh, you just get the one. And what you may see is that there's no other framework dependencies that are in here. And that's because I ended up using the vanilla TypeScript um, starter, uh, starter kit. Um, I had initially uh, tried to build this out, um, I think using the lit, uh, but then I realized that I really didn't need a component model for what I was trying to build. And so I just switched it out, removed some um, use, uses, and then I was good to go. But what you end up, um, you know, by, by default, you don't have to put a whole lot of functionality into your Vite config in order for it to be useful. Um, you know, you start off, uh, your, uh, you start off with just a default export, that if you want to get some additional functionality, um, you can just add them in. And this can either be from third-party generation. So as an example, um, I added in um, a library called Party Tool um, from Builder.io. Uh, this is functionality that allows for you to offload um, third-party libraries so that they run outside of the main thread and can improve the performance of your application. And I was using this for um, analytics. Um, I ended up embedding Google Analytics just so that I could see how many hits were on there. Um, but uh, this has integration in for Beat so that you can you know, uh, build it and still allow for that web worker to come into effect. But otherwise, you wouldn't need this. Um, and then the other one that I want to show is um, there's a common uh, plugin in the role environment uh, community to visualize your views. So, um, you know, by default, uh, so, uh, what you end up uh, getting is, here, let me pull this up. So if you've seen the Webpack Bundle Analyzer, um, this would be something that's kind of similar. Um, but what you can load for this is, <clears throat> uh, this is a view of your dependencies and how um, the, the project ends up building out its functionality. Um, so this is kind of hard to see, I know, but um, you can see that like my source files and my main.ts, um, you occupy a pretty small amount of this functionality. Um, the map library that I'm using, uh, map Libra, um, takes you know a, a much uh, larger substantial uh, size of the bundle. Um, and then some of the, the geospatial uh, tools that I was using, like TurfJS and functions, um, you know, add an additional functionality. And again, these are all just standard roll-up plugins. So you didn't have to wait for a whole lot of, you know, Vite-specific integration um, to work. But the end result of a lot of this is that, here, let's go to, you know, I can, um, uh, I can do an, npm run dev um, and the project will you know start up in you know usually this is less than a second 
um, but I can you know get my project up and running um, without uh, you know without uh, any of this breaking the breaking the bank. And in fact, my Windows machine uh, is usually the slower portion of this uh, process rather than uh, rather than the the build tool itself. Um, but yeah, so you can <clears throat> you can see this loaded up that same project. Um, if I want to make changes uh, to the code, then you know here I'm going to put this on its side just so we can see what that process looks like. You know, and then you get that same sort of reloading um, functionality. Um, if you you know if you're curious about kind of how long this process takes, um, there's nice shortcuts that are built into the development server and the like. Um, if I on a production build, then you can see what this process kind of looks like from here. And this does generally take a little bit longer. Um, like I mentioned, is this isn't as optimized for speed, and it's doing more of those optimizations for rollup and uh, and other elements. So after this is done, <clears throat> um, you can see it generates a report, and it shows that here I'll do this one bigger. You can see it built my index on HTML. Um, it shows me kind of how big uh, the the individual files are, um, <clears throat> and for the code that I deployed out there, you know it, it extracted out. So um, we can take the CSS uh, import and split those out and modify them. So after gzip, I get about 10k um, CSS. Um, you know, my JavaScript is not great. It gives you some warning about that. Um, saying, hey, I, I see that your code is you know, bigger than 500K after minification. Um, and there may be some ability for you to optimize that. Um, and, uh, uh, and so one of the things that I worked through was, you know, what are the ways that you can uh, optimize or refactor that? I made a couple of changes um, to the Vite uh, or to the uh, to the project structure. Uh, in particular, taking advantage of some of the dynamic code splitting. So using uh, import um, with uh, you know import as a function as opposed to the import uh, command, and that will dynamically create code splitted um, chunks that um, uh, that Rollup knows how to kind of separate out. So now, if I rerun this build. Um, then what we should hopefully see, uh, if I did this right, is that the uh, the files that get generated, you know, the input for them, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see a different set of outputs. So cross your fingers that this actually works. Okay, here we go. So yeah, so now you can see that the um, uh, that now I have an index.js file. It's all the way down to 21 bytes. Um, the map lever stuff is now down to 200. And this is still chunky. Right? You know, uh, it's a full map library. The nice thing is, is that you know we're not paying the full cost of that when the page initially loads. We still need it to load the map, right? Um, but uh, but this is, this, you know, you can use the same sort of tools that if you have experience um, doing web op, web packed optimizations, um, you get the same sort of functionality. You don't have to you don't have to relearn a bunch of diff different strategies, um, and you also just get it for free out of the box um, whenever you're doing your development uh, service servers. So uh, that's the that's the main project. Um, there's not a whole lot to look at here. Um, you know, all, all, most of the functionality is built into like this main.ts file. Um, you know, I import, I'm importing types, um, and then I have a, a bit of additional functionality. But any questions about the project or the code base or things that you would want to look at? Sure, um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, hello from Sioux Falls, by the way. Thanks for uh, uh, putting this online. That's great. Awesome. Glad um, to have you here. Thank you. Um, so 
it made me think of it when you were showing the the Vite, I think it was the Vite config, um, how you could set up the the web workers. Um, create React app, if I'm remembering right, like out of the box, it's set up to be, uh, it can be a, you can build out a progressive web app pretty easily. Does Vite offer that same kind of out of the box, uh, ready to go for PWA? Um, that's a good question. So I'm not real familiar with what great React app gets out of the box. Um, I see somebody in the uh, in the uh, in the room has their hand raised about that. So maybe you can tag team in. Yeah. So uh, Vite out of the box does not support progressive web apps. However, there is a Vite plugin that does. Uh, so if there's a community support one, it's super easy to uh, install. It's like Vite PWA or something like that, uh, and it's like you plug it into your app and it's got their documentation is great. So if you're looking to build a PWA with the, that's the way to do it. Cool. Yeah. Cause actually, I mean, most of the time, I guess I probably wouldn't. Right. So kind of having it as a plugin uh, makes right. sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the, that's the neat thing about a lot of this functionality is that it's new enough that you're taking advantage of a lot of the you know best practices, but it's also well established enough that you're not off on your own trying to reinvent the wheel, um, you know, because that because of that community hasn't coalesced. Um, they're on version four of Beat right now, and it's been around for a few years. So you know, it's it's matured enough to a place where you can really build some really ambitious applications with it. Nice. All right. Um, so, and and you know, uh, when when you hear uh, interviews with Evan Yu and other folks on the V uh, team, they're they're very uh, honest that they're building and standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, a lot of what they're doing is similar to what other tools have done in the past. Um, you know, not just Webpack and Rollup. Um, you know, those really blazed the trail and made it really possible to build you know big, complicated uh, applications out of JavaScript. Um, but then uh, a number of other bundler tools have taken the same strategy of building using standard technologies, um, web standards, out of the box. And in particular, they uh, pay homage to Parcel and Snowpack. Um, I wasn't familiar with either of these um, you know, prior to this, but Parcel is a tool that's still under active development that has the same sort of functionality where it tries to be an all-in-one bundler, but um, you know, does less work I'm turning off. And so uh, if you have, um, you know, and to parcel it, it seems like another useful tool if you're kind of interested in this sort of world. Um, I had heard of Snowpack, which is what this uh, library was. And it was another kind of a uh, tool that was built around ES modules. Um, but the, the developer that originally built it out said, hey, Beat is doing all of this stuff and it's doing it better than what we have, than what we are. Let's just use that. Uh, and so it's been, you know, it's been deprecated and the developer that originally worked on the Snowpack tool um, <clears throat> is is actually just leveraging um, Beat for some of the other tools that are being, uh, that they're building off right now. And like I mentioned, um, there's a lot of cool stuff that's being built on top of Beat, whether it's in the community uh, realm, like those PWA, or um, what I think of as meta framework. These are the frameworks that take some of the build tools that Beat gives you out of the box, and then it provides additional opinions or framework integrations um, that, that you get for, you know, uh, so you get a, a, a more uh, optimized development environment that's kind of tailored to one world. You know, if you think about like Next.js, that's usually the, the archetypal meta framework for React um, or Nuxt uh, for Vue. Well, Vite has a couple of these that are, but the, they're, they're uh, done in an interesting way. So as an example, um, <clears throat> the analog uh, framework is one that tries to uh, take that same um, meta framework functionality and build it on top of Angular. You know, there hasn't been a whole lot of um, uh, players in the space of, like, let's take Angular as a UI build tool. Um, but let's put in, um, you know, the ability to do uh, server-side rendering out of the box um, or, uh, or file-based routing, um, you know, in API routes. Some of those nice features. Um, <clears throat> and, and so Analog tries to do that, but it builds on top of Vite. Um, because that you know it gives you that flexibility to kind of build some of those opinions in for free. 
So, um, so this is something that if you're an Angular developer or if you just haven't played around with because you didn't, you know, it was just a bit too low level and it didn't give you some of those opinions, Analog might be something to check out. Another tool that's been built on top of the is uh, what's called Astro. And so this is a really cool uh, static generator. Um, and it's built on top of it for all of its development. Um, but the the cool thing about this is that um, you know most meta frameworks are kind of uh, set up so that you're tied to a particular framework, right? So if you build something using Next, well, you get a lot of nice opinions, but you're using React and nothing but React. Whereas with Astro, because it is built on top of Beats, you can use whatever, not any uh, framework, but you get a ton of framework integrations for free, um, just because that like you can play with basically any of them using those first party integrations. So if you like Svelte, if you like React, if you like Vue, um, if you like Lit, um, Tailwind, all these just come for free because that you're building using a tool chain that doesn't you know only rely on you using one framework to make that function. I really like this. Um, and in fact, I built a second uh, uh, application using Astro, um, but, uh, but I'm already uh, running late on time, so we'll, we'll bypass that. But again, if you if you like static site generators, um, Astro, super cool, uh, and also built on top of it. All right. Um, so there, there's a nice, there's a number of nice things that uh, you get either out of the box. Um, so one of the questions that I often hear is, well, what about editors? You know, how do I, you know, I, I, when I am building out my Angular app, I really need to get the Angular CLI. Um, and the the cool thing about Beat is because it is built on top of your own, um, you know, standard JavaScript tooling, most editors just get this for free out of the box. So it doesn't matter if you are a fan of VS Code. Um, if you are like Nick and you're a big Vim uh, user, um, or if you like if you like Eclipse, you know all of these um, they just they're just JavaScript files uh, and they get loaded directly. You know there's not a whole lot of just uh, caching or other tools that your projects have to do um, to to get those for free. You, know, uh, you don't have to see a whole lot of uh, editor integration. You just run the command and then it just gets out of your way. So I wanted to talk through, um, you know, one of the one of the cool things about um, uh, Beat is that it takes advantage of some of the uh, some of the kind of more modern uh, ideas in terms of um, we have uh, we have as a JavaScript ecosystem, um, I've seen a whole lot of churn over the last probably ten years um, in terms of the tools um, and you know processes that folks have, and and that has started to kind of start uh, to less into there are a couple of best practices or tools that are kind of really winning in the marketplace. Um, can we take some of those, rebuild them using you know, faster tools and technologies, um, and you know that are only doing the things that we that we want and nothing more? So um, there's been a number of advances of uh, trying to build some JavaScript tools in languages other than JavaScript. And in particular, ES Build um, is kind of interesting. Um, it's a it's a tool that is really built to optimize and build your JavaScript, but it's built using Go. Um, another really popular one that's been making a lot of progress is what's called the Speedy Web Web Compiler or SWC. Uh, that's a tool that's built in Rust, um, and they're you know they're they're really ambitious, right? They're taking a lot of the lessons that have been kind of learned over a decade of JavaScript development, and they're trying to really tailor and optimize them for like what's being done just on the UI, you know, for these particular best use cases. You know, you're no longer trying to um, remove like Facebook flow annotations, right? You're just working on focusing on TypeScript. And one of the things that ES Build does um, by default for TypeScript is it doesn't actually check your uh, your TypeScript types instead because that uh, what they found is that that's a really expensive operation to do, um, and your editor is probably going to do that better than what your you know than what your build tool is. So instead, all that it does is just removes the types um, from your code so that it can be served up to a web browser. Again, it's the do less work and go faster sort of approach. Um, so, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what uh, what these sorts of tools um, are like, how they are progressing, and where we draw those lines. 
you know, there's because there's definitely trade offs to this style of development. Um, you know, I, as a JavaScript programmer, um, can no longer go in and actually view or I can't I can't modify or easily like um, add in plugins to ES build or SWC because they're built using kind of more native tools. Right. There's there's plus sides and downsides to it. But, um, you know, for for well established patterns that, um, you know, are pretty well defined and are you know considered to be best practices for what our industry is, maybe it does make sense to kind of rebuild those using as fast of a tool as possible. So again, I think that's the that's the takeaway that if you're thinking through this, um, you know, we we have as a industry really built a lot of uh, tooling um, over the years, um, and every once in a while, it probably take, makes sense to take a step back and think through how much of this is actually benefiting us, um, you know, for our day to day work, and how much is just um, carrying over some of the legacy or the baggage that we had to deal with you know, years and years ago. You know, on the Java side, I always think about the war files and ear files that I had, would have to build when I was deploying out to my, my Java code to application container servers, things like um, BEA WebLogic um, or, you know, you know, or IBM WebSphere. Um, those have kind of gone by the wayside. And so now a lot of times you can either build standalone executable jars um, or you can just you know, put an embedded uh, Tomcat into your Spring container directly. Um, you know, maybe you don't even need to know, maybe you don't even need Spring. Um, you know, these, these are the wild ambitious uh, questions that it, it probably makes sense to think through um, you know, on a date on a time by time basis. You have nothing to lose, but uh, you know, the, the, but the slow build times for your projects. So that's all that I had. Um, again, thank you for letting me present. Um, I appreciate the flexibility that everyone had, and I'm glad that you know we were able to get um, this hybrid meeting going up in place. Um, I'm going to have the slides uh, available for this um, on the meetup, um, and then you can always view me on uh, my website. Um, and then uh, I, I have on the Premier Car Henge based uh, Mastodon server. Um, so come and friend me there, and we'll have a great time. Uh, but again, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Yes, I see one in the room. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of about the ES, ES build versus roll up. Do you know if there's uh, reasoning? Like, I, I've briefly read the documentation, and V tries to address it, but it's not like a, a super great explanation. Of why they're using two separate things when it seems like they could be using one or the other. Right. Like good reasoning behind both of them. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so the yeah the best explanation uh, that I've heard um, actually came on a podcast um, that uh, our very own Nick Nisi uh, did an interview with uh, Evan Yu. Um, so if you pull if you uh, pull up your favorite podcast app, go to JS Party. Uh, and look at the deep dive on Vite. Uh, one section of it, um, in fact, let's see if we, there is a transcript on here. If I can find, pull up the proposals, roll up system, roll up with Vite. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so Amal asked that same question of, hey, why are why are you why are you using two different tools? Um, and what Evan says is that at least at this time, rollup is just more mature. Um, you know, if you want to do uh, code splitting, um, if you want to be able to cache um, or you know set up chunking, um, rollup. You know, the the folks that have been developing that have had five years to optimize that and really make it great so that you're delivering the minimal amount of JavaScript that's necessary for it to be delivered to the um, to the browser. Um, and ESBuild just isn't there yet. Now, you know, what, what he has said is like we'd love to see, you know, kind of a, a Rust based version of roll up or, you know, another implementation. Um, and you know, they're open to making a change all the time. Um, but at least at this moment, roll up is still the king in terms of like giving the best experience to your users. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions?
All right. Well, I think that's all that I got. Thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Matt.